Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for this webinar uh, with Dr. Lewin titled, Do You Know Your BRCA or Genetic Status? This is our very first webinar, so we're very excited for all of you to join us today. And we are sitting here in our Brooklyn Teal Community Center. My name is Pamela, and I have Elizabeth with me as well. Hi. Hi. She says hello. <laughs> um, if you can't hear us right now, um, we ask that you make sure that you click that phone button in the left-hand corner. You wouldn't be able to hear me saying that. <laughs> but uh, if you can hear us, you're all set and we're ready to go. So um, just give us a moment. And what we'd like to do is hear from everybody. If you can just test your chat up in the right-hand corner, there's a little bubble. If you click that button, why don't you all tell us where you're calling in from? And this way we know that your sound is working OK, and we'll get started. Okay, we've got a couple of New Yorkers here, so it sounds like a few of you have your sound going. I think as we uh, have more people joining us, we'll uh, maybe repeat that once more a little bit later, but um, just a reminder, everybody's muted, and um, we're going to get started now. So I'm going to just, I'm uh, sorry, the agenda for tonight is just a quick introduction from us here at Teal and then a presentation from Dr. Lewin, and then we're going to save some Q&A for the end, but feel free to write in any questions along the way, and we'll read them at the end. So we are here, like I said, in our Teal Community Center. Teal for us stands for Tell Every Amazing Lady About Ovarian Cancer, Louisa M. McGregor Ovarian Cancer Foundation. It's a long name for our nonprofit, and that's why we go with Peel, again, which stands for Tell Every Amazing Lady. We have three parts to our mission. We spend a lot of time promoting awareness and education all across the United States, New York City, and beyond. We also provide support to survivors, and we fund medical research. Part of uh, what we do is when we're out and about spreading awareness, it could be a night like tonight where we're doing a free webinar to provide education and signs and symptoms um, education for anybody who'd like more information. We also uh, get involved with hospitals and schools and local community uh, organizations, including health fair. So um, we're really tirelessly spreading the word about ovarian cancer, which does not have a screening test. Other things that we do is provide resources for survivors and their families. So we do have a lot of free support groups and um, all different types of resources for family members, men, women, children, the survivors themselves. These are some pictures from some of our walks. A lot of people know our Teal Walk, and it takes place in many different locations. And this is one of the ways that we honor our survivors. And then our medical research program, uh, which Dr. Lewin is uh, on the board of for our scientific advisory board, we do a lot of um, uh, medical research that we've funded throughout the country's most prestigious hospitals and institutions around. You can read a lot more about this on our website. And we must educate uh, even tonight just to let everybody be reminded, or if you're not sure um, about ovarian cancer, that there is no screening test. Most women aren't really sure what those signs and symptoms are, and it is usually diagnosed at a late stage. So we really encourage you to know those symptoms and learn more about those risk factors that we'll be speaking about tonight. We also advocate to listen to your body and know the symptoms, to keep doctor appointments, and to go for those annual screenings. If anybody has any questions about Teal, you also can ask them at the end. And of course, on our website, um, a lot of the answers that you might be looking for can be found, but we're here to help you. So without further ado, we are going to uh, introduce Dr. Lewin. And Dr. Sharon Lewin is a member of the Teal Scientific Advisory Board. She is the Director of Gynecology Oncology at Holy Name Hospital and is an Associate Professor at Mount Sinai. She will be sharing a wonderful presentation, Do You Know Your BRCA and Genetic Status? So please remember to save your questions until the end, and we would like to introduce Dr. Lewin. Just give us a moment for her to um, switch her screen. It, something may change visually for you in just a second, but you'll be able to see her slides um, 
in a moment. Thank you all for joining us. And feel free to um, send messages in the chat if you're experiencing any uh, problems or need any kind of help. Good evening. Thank you all for joining us this evening. I will be very happy to entertain any questions about hereditary genetics, ovarian cancer, GYN oncology at the end of our presentation. First of all, I would really love to thank Pamela and the whole team at Teal for inviting me to speak about hereditary genetics, which is so important when we're talking about ovarian cancer and gynecologic cancer. So I've really watched this organization bloom and blossom over the years and it's really incredible what they do for patients and families and researchers all across the country. So I really applaud you. Our objectives this evening, let me just So our objectives this evening, we are going to speak about hereditary genetics. Do you know your BRCA status? And then I thought at the end we would talk a little bit about wellness strategies and healthy living. So do you know your BRCA status? Why is this important? So over the past few years, we've learned tremendously about the important role that hereditary genetics has when it comes to ovarian cancer. And sort of moving forward, when I say ovarian cancer, that'll also incorporate fallopian tube cancer and a certain kind of cancer that's called primary peritoneal cancer. It starts in the saran wrap lining of the abdomen and pelvis. Not quite as common as ovarian cancer, but these three types of cancers are treated the same when it comes to surgery and chemotherapy. So I'll just say ovarian cancer moving forward, but it really incorporates those three disease types. We do know from the literature that at least 17% of women with high-grade serous ovarian cancer have a BRCA mutation. And depending on what studies you look at, high-grade serous cancer is the most common cell type that we see with ovarian cancer. Even up to 20% of women with ovarian cancer of this high-grade serous type can have a BRCA mutation. Once we discovered that and the literature was published, this is what prompted the national guidelines to recommend that all women with epithelial ovarian cancer undergo genetic testing, really regardless of age or family history. And epithelial ovarian cancer is one type of ovarian cancer. High-grade serous falls in that category. It's really the most type of common type of ovarian cancer that we see. So any of the national guidelines, if we're looking at the Society of G1 Oncology, the American um, Society of Clinical Oncology, the NCCN, which is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, essentially all the national guidelines recommend that women with ovarian cancer have genetic testing. So first I want to talk about what the BRCA genes are. So these are human genes that produce what are called tumor suppressor proteins. So we all have these BRCA genes, and the BRCA genes essentially have proteins that are very important um, to repair damaged DNA. So those of us that have functional BRCA genes are able to really repair DNA in an appropriate fashion. But when any of these genes are altered, having what's called a BRCA1 or a BRCA2 mutation, the protein product is not made properly, so DNA damage cannot be repaired. And essentially what happens is that cells are much more likely to develop additional aberrations or alterations which lead to cancer. So unfortunately, we're all bombarded every day with different factors that cause damage to our DNA, whether it's environment or nutrition or different chemicals. And the BRCA genes are just very important genes of part of what's called a homologous recombination pathway, sort of a big word, but it's essentially a very important way that, that DNA is repaired, specifically DNA double-stranded breaks. So the bottom line is when these genes are, are damaged or, or mutated and don't function properly, it puts women at m and men at such a high risk for developing cancer. So for specifically with women, very high risk of breast and ovarian cancer and other types of cancers as well, specifically pancreas, prostate, although most commonly breast and ovarian, and we'll talk about that a little more too. It's important to know that a harmful BRCA mutation can be inherited from either mom or dad's side of the family. So each child of a parent who carries a mutation has a 50% chance of inheriting the mutation. 
So, so often when we're taking family histories, which are so important, we see people just focus on mom's side of the family, but it's really important to look at dad's side of the family as well, too, because these mutations can be inherited from either mom or dad's side of the family. Something just real quickly to talk about is the two-hit hypothesis. Um, basically, we know that when genes are normal, when a hit comes along that's just something in the environment, it takes a lot more time for something to develop into a cancer. When you have a BRC mutation or another gene that's altered, there is a first hit sort of present in, in any cell. So then when some other factor comes along, it leads to really a more rapid acceleration to cancer. So we do know that not every woman with a BRC1 or 2 mutation will develop cancer, but we really don't watch and wait for that to happen because we do know that it doesn't take much for a second hit to come along and then have a rapid acceleration to cancer. So why do we care about BRCA mutations? And that's why if anyone on the call has a history of ovarian cancer or even a family history of ovarian cancer, it's very, very important that you have genetic testing. And now we know that it's much more than just BRCA, which we'll talk about a little later this evening. Why do we care about this is because we do know that women with BRC mutations have a significantly increased risk of cancer compared to the general population. As you can see from the red bars, a woman with a BRC mutation has about a 50% chance of developing breast cancer by the age of 50, which is much higher than the general population, which is only 2%. The risk of breast cancer by the age of 70 is almost 90%, 87%, which is something that was quoted by Angelina Jolie, as you may recall in her op-ed piece, much higher than the general population. And again, the risk of ovarian cancer is very high, um, depending if it's BRC1 or BRC2 that's mutated at least 44%, which is certainly much higher than the general population, which is under 1%. So there's nothing worse than being cured of your first cancer and really being unrecognized that you have a genetic mutation and going on to develop a second cancer. So we do know that men and women who have BRC mutations have a significant risk of a second cancer. So as you can see from the red bars, the risk of developing a second cancer after the first one if it's breast cancer that we're talking about, it's almost 30% within the first five years compared to the general population. The risk of a second breast cancer by the age of 70, if someone has a BRC mutation, is about 64%. Again, much higher than the general population of 11%. And then ovarian cancer within 10 years after a breast cancer diagnosis is at least 13%, so much higher than the general population. One of my favorite patients had breast cancer in her 40s and was cured, then breast cancer in her 50s and was cured, and then I met her at age 62 with her stage 2 ovarian cancer. So unfortunately, we see that many times along the way, if someone is not appropriately identified and tested, that that second and even third cancer could certainly be prevented. Um, the reason I talk about this is that even though all the national data says that all women with ovarian cancer need genetic testing, unfortunately we see that less than half of women with ovarian cancer in the U.S. are actually tested. So it's really my passion in life to really educate as much as possible so people with a personal or family history um, can definitely seek the appropriate genetic counseling and testing. So what are the things that we think of sort of indicators of possibly having a hereditary cancer syndrome, which means something that you may have that can put you at high risk for having a defective gene leading to cancer? So certainly ovarian cancer, as we spoke about. All women with a personal history of ovarian cancer or even a family history of ovarian cancer. The guidelines sort of say if it's a first or second degree relative on mom or dad's side of the family with ovarian cancer, that definitely warrants genetic testing. It's really a big red flag. If we do see an early age at diagnosis, so exam, for example, breast cancer under the age of 45 or 50, that really may warrant genetic testing. If we see cancer in two or more close relatives on the same side of the family, combinations of cancers that may be indicative of a specific syndrome. So for example, we've been talking about, about breast and ovarian cancer that um, could indicate something called hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, which is abbreviated HBOC. But there's another important thing to think about uh, Lynch syndrome, 
which not only can have colon and uterine cancers, but also can ovar have ovarian cancer as well, too. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. And of course, if there are multiple rare cancers in the family or multiple primary tumors, all of these things should really raise a red flag that there could be a hereditary component. And these men and women certainly definitely warrant genetic counseling and testing. So just to show you a little bit, these are the cancer risk estimates for BRC mutation carriers, sort of a summary of 22 studies. And you can see, as you can see, there is a significant cumulative risk of having both ovarian and breast cancer with a BRC1 or BRC2 mutation. We do see there's certainly a higher risk of both of those cancers with a BRC1 mutation, and particularly at younger ages, which is why sort of the screening recommendations and guidelines are a little different for women who have a BRC1 or BRC2 mutation. Some of the strategies for risk reducing, uh, ovarian cancer risk reducing strategies, I should say, is that there is no effective screening test for ovarian cancer, unfortunately. That's why Teal and many others have done such a good job to educate women about the signs and symptoms of ovarian cancer and about the risks when it comes to hereditary cancer risks, because if we know someone has a BRCA mutation or a mutation in another high-risk gene, we do recommend screening only until women are done having children, and then they really need to have prophylactic surgery. Really the best with a BRCA1 and 2 mutation is what's called a bilateral salpingo oophorectomy, which means to remove the tubes and ovaries bilaterally. Um, there are pros and cons about removing the uterus as well, too, and it is a little bit controversial right now in the literature, but certainly the tubes and ovaries absolutely need to be removed. For women who are young, still of childbearing age, and not ready to have their ovaries or tubes removed, they can have a vaginal ultrasound as well as blood work for what's called the CA125 every six months. However, we do know that those are not very specific or sensitive tests, and they certainly cannot detect cancers at early stages. One thing that's certainly helpful for women who are young who may have a BRCA mutation or another genetic mutation is the birth control pill, which is shown to be very effective in all women, actually, to prevent ovarian cancers. A risk reduction anywhere from 60 to 80 percent, just depending on how long women are on the birth control pill. So that's also very, very helpful as well as tamoxifen is a helpful strategy, uh, not only for the ovaries, but the breasts as well, too. So when we talk about ovarian cancer risks groups, I love to sort of break it into three different risks. And tonight, we're kind of talking about the women that fall into the bottom category. These are women that have a high risk because of an inherited risk. They either have a defective or a faulty BRCA1 or 2 mutation, or they have a mutation in one of the genes associated with Lynch syndrome. So these factors kind of translate into a high lifetime risk of ovarian cancer. And you can see the risks in the parentheses. As you see with BRCA1, it can be anywhere from up to 60% lifetime risk. BRCA2 is a little bit smaller. Lynch syndrome can be anywhere from 10 to 12%. Play women who have a defect in one of the genes associated with Lynch can develop ovarian cancer at young ages in their 40s. So it's very, very important that for these families, we're taking important family and personal histories to try and prevent these cancers from developing. Thankfully, ovarian cancer is not very common, and most people fall into the average risk group, which is less than 2% lifetime chance. These are really women that have no family history of early onset breast cancer or any other risk factors. So my goal is to try to identify people who fall into the inherited risk and obviously try to remove their tubes and ovaries before the cancers develop. The hard category to treat is the one in the middle. These are women who have no mutated genes, but they may have a slightly increased lifetime risk, anywhere from 2 to 5%, because potentially some type of infertility, they've never been pregnant, they may have a first-degree relative with ovarian cancer, or a first-degree relative with very early onset breast cancer. So these women definitely require some unique individualized counseling on what to do with their ovaries since we really have no good screening mechanism. This is the likelihood of having a BRCA1 and 2 mutation. We do know that BRCA mutations are much more common among the Ashkenazi Jewish population. We know that 1 in 40 Ashkenazi Jewish men and women carry a a defective BRCA mutation. In a general population, those who are not Ashkenazi Jewish, it's much higher. It's about 1 in 300 to 1 in 400 people carry a mutation. 
Um, but we do know that if a woman has breast or ovarian cancer and she's Ashkenazi Jewish, particularly at, at a young age, she's about a 25% chance, if we're talking about breast cancer, of having a BRC mutation. So certainly quite high. We do know if a woman is Jewish and has a personal history of ovarian cancer, regardless of her age, she's about a 35 to 40% chance of having a BRC mutation. And as you can see, not Ashkenazi Jewish with ovarian cancer at any age, really still a high chance of having a BRC mutation, anywhere from 17 to really 21%. So really, breast cancer at a young age, ovarian cancer at any age, really these are red flags that a woman could have a BRC mutation. The importance of genetic testing, as I mentioned, you know, 1 in 300 to 1 in 500 or 1 in 400, it depends on which paper you read, carry a mutation in one of the BRCA genes. And we know that at least 17 to 20 percent of women with ovarian cancer have a BRC mutation. And it's important to note that almost half of the identified mutation carriers have no breast or ovarian cancer in a first or second degree relative. So, and as I mentioned, among Ashkenazi Jewish women, about one in 40 carry a BRC mutation. So the bottom line is anyone with a personal history of ovarian cancer definitely needs BRCA or genetic testing. Um, if you have a family history with a first or second degree relative with ovarian cancer, that definitely warrants genetic testing. And there are some other criteria as well that we'll speak about. We do know that almost 22% of women with breast cancer in the community population are potentially at risk for having a defective gene that puts them at high risk for cancer. And 100% of the women with ovarian cancer are at risk. So it's really important that if women meet certain criteria, they certainly undergo genetic counseling and testing. And of course, we know among all risk factors for breast and ovarian cancer, BRCA increases the risk more than really any other factor combined. So I definitely have a lot of patients say to me all the time, why should I get tested? So it really helps us individualize medical management. So we do know that um, it helps us accurately talk about risk stratification, what is the risk for breast cancer, what is the risk for ovarian cancer. You know, the power of a negative test is very, very powerful. It does help alleviate a lot of anxiety and uncertainty. It does tell us if the test is positive, whether or not to undergo screening or prophylactic surgery, but really the accurate risk stratification is what's so important. You know, and unfortunately, the genetics does not identify all cases of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, and we'll talk a little bit more about panel testing which is why that really is the most comprehensive way to identify patients who may have a high risk predisposition for hereditary cancer. I just want to show you some of what's called the NCCN guidelines. These are the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines. So these are things that clinicians, doctors, nurses, uh, geneticists use nationally published guidelines that talk about if you meet this criteria, you definitely need to have genetic counseling and testing. I'm not going to read all of them, but I just want to highlight a few things. That if a woman has a personal history of breast cancer at a young age, 45 or under, she definitely meets criteria for genetic testing. If a woman is any age with breast cancer and has one relative with breast cancer under the age of 50, and that one relative can be first, second, or third degree, she meets criteria for testing. Of course, if someone has um, a family member with ovarian cancer at any age, especially a first and second degree relative, that meets criteria. Triple negative breast cancer under the age of 60 or really any age because that's really sort of a rare type of breast cancer. And of course, now we're looking at more advanced prostate and pancreas cancers. And of course, male breast cancers definitely require uh, genetic counseling and testing. As I've said a few times, any personal history of ovarian cancer certainly meets criteria. Personal history of male breast cancer, and of course, if there's a known BRC mutation in the, in the family. So these are the guidelines that um, warrant genetic counseling and testing. Um, this is paid for by insurance companies if you do meet the criteria. Uh, there are laws in place called the GINA Act. They're congressional laws that do protect patients, so you cannot have any insurance loss or insurance discrimination if you have any type of genetic mutation. Sometimes there can be some caveats when it comes to life insurance state by state, um, so it's important that you do check on that. But most people who are denied life insurance, it's really because of their own personal or family history and really has nothing to do with the genetic testing results. 
So if we know that a woman has a BRC mutation, when it comes to breast cancer, she could either have a mastectomy with reconstruction, that's one option to reduce her risk of breast cancer, or she can undergo screening, which involves a mammogram alternating with a breast MRI every six months, starting at the age of 25. So the surveillance is actually so good for breast. Uh, cancer and early detection, that that is a really viable option for women if they don't want to undergo surgery. Unfortunately, as we've said many times, we don't have a good screening mechanism for ovarian cancer, so the recommendations are to have women undergo removal of their tubes and ovaries once they're done having children. That does reduce the risk of ovarian cancer as much as 96 to 98 percent. Um, and it also reduces the risk of breast cancer as well, too, for these women. So that is uh, really the recommendations. When, when a woman has a BRC1 mutation, the national guidelines recommend removing the tooth and ovaries at the age of 40, or whenever a woman is done having children. There's a slightly increased risk of ovarian cancer between 35 and 40, actually, in these women with BRC1 mutations. So certainly when they're done having children, the tubes and ovaries should be removed. For BRC2 mutation carriers, the risk of ovarian cancer, ovarian cancer happens at a little bit of a later age. So the recommendations are to remove the tubes and ovaries by the age of 45. Um, so then this woman can wait a little bit longer to keep their estrogen and avoid menopause. I do want to say really quickly, I know this isn't part of the genetics, but Teal does such a wonderful job to educate about the signs and symptoms of ovarian cancer. We do know that it really is not always silent. In the postmenopausal women, the majority of patients have these symptoms prior to diagnosis. Any abdominal or pelvic pain, bloating, difficulty eating, feeling full too quickly, difficulty with urination, or any pelvic pain. So unfortunately, most of the women I see with ovarian cancer have really had symptoms for six, nine, even 12 months. They often have been worked up for many different things and ultimately are diagnosed with ovarian cancer, but the symptoms are usually there for a very long period of time uh, before the cancer is actually diagnosed. So really educating about the signs and symptoms to really help with earlier detection is so important. I do want to say a few words about Lynch syndrome because so far I've spoken about BRCA, but Lynch syndrome is very important when we're talking about ovarian cancer um, as well as colon and uterine cancer. We do know that Lynch syndrome, which is also an inherited syndrome, there are five genes that can be uh, defective. It's the most common cause of hereditary colon cancer, but we do know that women with Lynch syndrome have an increased risk of both uterine or endometrial cancer as well as ovarian cancer. And according to data from N.D. Anderson, we know that women with Lynch syndrome are just as likely to first present with their uterine cancer as they are with colon cancer. And often if their uterine cancer, which is curable, is not recognized as being a hereditary condition for these women, they may quickly go on to develop a very advanced colon cancer, which is definitely not as easy to treat. As you can see from the green bars, this is the risk of ovarian, uterine, and colon cancer if you have Lynch syndrome. So you can see it's much higher than the general population risk, which is in purple. We also see that there's a significantly increased risk of uterine cancer compared to the general population and colon cancer in both men and women. So you can see for men in the red bar, the risk of colon cancer is about 80% with Lynch syndrome, and with colon cancer it's about 60%. So just like we saw with BRCA mutations, Lynch syndrome also increases the risk of a second cancer. So nothing worse than being cured from your first cancer and then being unrecognized as having a genetic mutation and developing a second cancer. So you can see there is a significant risk of developing a first, a second cancer, excuse me, 10 years after the first cancer with Lynch syndrome, about a 30% risk, much higher than the general population, which is in yellow. And then the 15 years after the first cancer diagnosis is about 50% for Lynch syndrome patients, which is much, much higher than the general population. So some of the guidelines for Lynch testing for cancer patients is if a woman has colon or uterine cancer under age 50, so again, very young ages. If someone has colon cancer under the age of 60 and has something that's called MSI high histology, so that's something that is done and tested on the tumor itself. Also some of these rare types of, of tumor or pathology that you see, mucinous signet renin cells, those things definitely warrant genetic testing. A lot of times with uterine and colon cancer, they may do some what's called MSI testing on the tumor. These are basically stains that are done on the tumor itself 
and any abnormal staining definitely warrants genetic testing. So Lynch syndrome typically has colon cancer is the most common cancer that's seen with Lynch. We also see endometrial or uterine, as I mentioned, ovarian cancer, and stomach cancer. There are a few other cancers in the family that are less common, like kidney cancer and small bowel cancer. But if there are two or more of these Lynch syndrome cancers at any age in the family, that warrants testing. Or Lynch syndrome cancer in one patient with one or more relatives with one of these cancers, all definitely warrants genetic counseling and testing. For patients who don't have cancer, some of the red flags to think about in the family are three or more relatives with one of these Lynch syndrome cancers that I mentioned, colon, endometrium, ovarian, stomach. If there are two or more relatives with one of these cancers, particularly one under the age of 50, and obviously there's identified Lynch syndrome mutation in the family. So one of my favorite patients developed ovarian cancer when she was 46, and we did genetic testing on her like we do test all the women uh, with ovarian cancer for genetic mutations. And we actually do a panel testing, and I'll talk to you about that in a few more details. So it's not really, it looks for BRC mutations, but also mutations in one of the genes associated with Lynch syndrome, as well as several other mutated genes that we now know can put women at high risk for ovarian cancer. And she actually had a mutation in one of the genes associated with Lynch syndrome. So it's very important to know that not only for her care, but also for her children's sake as well too. So genetic testing is just very, very important for all our women with ovarian cancer, as well as our patients with cancer, without cancer, who may have some of these red flags that we've spoken about. So unfortunately, <clears throat> there was some data that was presented about three years ago now looking at how poor, unfortunately, medical oncologists are at taking a good cancer family history. And one of the problems is, is that you know, someone thinks that someone is talking to these patients with cancer about their family history, and at the end of the day, it's like pointing arrows in different directions because someone thinks the oncologist should do it or the OBGYN should do it or the internist or the surgeon, and at the end of the day, these patients are unfortunately not getting tested. So ASCO, which is the American Society of Clinical Oncology, put forth a really important guideline for doctors saying that we need to be taking a minimum cancer family history. And so that's why I bring this up today, because if you don't know your family history, please, after this call tonight, talk to your family and ask who in your family has had cancer, what cancers have they had, and at what ages. So we as physicians need to be asking, as a minimum, who has had cancer on both mom and dad's side of the family, what type of cancer they are, and at what age. And these are the things that help guide us towards genetic counseling and testing. Again, just to go back to the earlier slide, if you're talking to your family members and you find these things in your family, please speak to your doctors about genetic testing. If there's any ovarian cancer in the family, if there are early ages of cancer diagnosis, if there are cancer in two or more close relatives on the same side of the family, if you do see combinations of cancers like colon and uterine cancer or ovarian cancer for Lynch syndrome or breast and ovarian cancer for HBOC or multiple rare cancers. So these are the things that really should raise a red flag that there may be a genetic component to cancer. I think we went over this slide already. Just want to talk about Lynch syndrome and surveillance. So if we know someone has Lynch syndrome, like my patient who's 40, she has three young children. So how does the surveillance change? So we know that someone who has a defect in one of the genes associated with Lynch has a very high risk of developing colon cancer, as we saw on the previous slides. So these men and women need to start having colonoscopies at the age of 25, and the colonoscopy should actually be every one to two years because we do see that there is a much more rapid acceleration from polyps to cancer in men and women that have Lynch syndrome. Unfortunately, there's no good gynecologic cancer screen, so we do recommend prophylactic hysterectomy and removing the tubes and ovaries when these women are done having children. So this is one important measure to really help prevent ovarian and uterine cancer in these women that have Lynch syndrome. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about panel testing. So, so far I've been talking to you just about BRC mutations and how that can increase a woman's risk of breast and ovarian cancer. I've also talked to you about Lynch syndrome and the genes associated that can cause a higher risk of colon, uterine, and ovarian cancer. 
Because we know that multiple genes can increase the risk of cancer, as you can see, breast cancer on this slide could be caused by many defective genes, BRCA1 and 2, as well as the other genes that are shown here. We also know that one defective gene, like P53, can cause many different kinds of cancers. So there's certainly a tremendous overlap. And this is what led to the development of panel testing, and really this is the most appropriate way to test people for genetic mutations. So we're not testing anymore really just BRCA genes or just the genes associated with Lynch, but we're actually doing panel testing because that is really the way to increase the detection rate of any of these defective genes. So there were essentially three oral presentations at ASCO about three years ago that helped guide the recommendations for panel testing. So I just want to tell you about those real quickly. So there was one study that was done, and having an oral presentation at this meeting is extremely competitive, so it just shows you how important these studies are. So there were a little over 1,700 women with breast cancer, and they actually excluded Jewish women, so they were looking at a more average risk population. And of the women that had mutated genes, about 68% of those um, who had mutated genes, they were in BRCA1 and BRCA2, but about 32% of them that had genetic mutations were in other genes. And those, those would have been missed if those women only underwent BRCA testing without having panel testing. So 32% of the defective genes were in genes other than BRCA1 and BRCA2. Similarly, there was another oral presentation looking at over 1,200 men and women suspicious for having Lynch syndrome. Similarly, of the genes that were mutated, about 73% of them were in one of the genes associated with Lynch, but interestingly, about 27% of those that were mutated were in other genes, and certainly those men and women would have been missed if they had not undergone a panel testing. And lastly, looking at ovarian cancer, almost 650 women, this was a third oral presentation. Of the genes that were mutated, the majority were in BRCA1 and 2, about 60%, but almost 40% of the genetic mutations were in other genes. So these hereditary genes would have definitely been missed if a panel testing had not been done. So these three oral presentations sort of paved the way for panel testing to really be the testing of the present. It's definitely recommended by NCCN and the national organizations, and certainly what's paid for by insurance companies. Let me just go back one slide. So now if you're going to have genetic testing, it's really important that you have a panel. The panel looks for BRCA1 and 2 mutations, mutations in one of the genes associated with Lynch, and also in many other genes. For example, RAD51, C and D, a BRIP. There are many other genes that we've now identified that put men and women at higher risk for having hereditary cancers. So a panel testing is really what needs to be done. Honestly, the industry leader when it comes to genetic testing is Myriad Genetics. Their panel currently has uh, 28 different genes, I believe, that tests for at least eight different kinds of hereditary cancers. I bring this up because if women had BRCA testing many years ago, they now may qualify for update testing, or you can go and have genetic testing done to look for those other genes. So if you have a personal history of ovarian cancer or a family history, and the BRCA testing was negative a while ago, I would really encourage you to go back and have genetic testing and update test to look at all those other genes that we know are high risk to see if there could be a different type of genetic testing, and that should definitely be covered by your insurance. I do want to talk a little bit about gynecologic health, but since I am a gynecologic oncologist, I would like to dispel some of the myths um, that it is really important to see your gynecologist every year. You may not need a pap smear, um, but it's really important that you see your gynecologist every year and certainly have a pelvic exam. Um, it's important, too, to do breast self-exams and have a mammogram every year. The guidelines have been a little bit controversial about mammograms, but I do believe uh, the recommendations that say to start at 40. It's important, um, pap smears should start at the age of 21, and there is a little bit of, depending on what age you are, and if you ever had HPV, to talk about the frequency of pap smears, but it is important, please see your gynecologist every year. There was a study done that shows that less than half of women do see their gynecologist every year. They're more interested in taking care of other people, which women do so well, 
but it's important that you really prioritize your own health because that is such an important exam and place to talk about not only genetics, but also cancer prevention as well, too. HPV vaccine has been very, very helpful to prevent HPV infection, which also can lead to decreased risk of abnormal pap smears and colposcopies, and certainly has been shown to reduce the incidence of cervical cancer. Really important to have a colonoscopy every year starting at the age of 50, unless you have a family history that needs to start earlier, and bone mineral density to screen for osteoporosis. Other wellness strategies that are very important to talk about very quickly, so many studies now talk about the importance of diet and exercise. We do know there are 11 different types of cancers, including ovarian cancer and breast cancer that is linked to obesity. So it's very important to have a healthy diet, to try and exercise at least 30 minutes, five days a week, and to stay within an ideal body weight. There is some important prevention um, these things that I've mentioned, aspirin, metformin, which is a drug that's often given to diabetics to lower their sugars, have both been shown to um, potentially reduce the risk of cancer or cancer recurrence. So those are important things to speak to your doctor about and see if you're a candidate for these preventative strategies. Most importantly, as we said at the beginning of the talk, be your own health advocate. Please do speak to your family members about who in the family has had cancer, what cancers at what ages, speak to your gynecologist, your internist, any of your doctors about genetic testing and counseling. We have many wonderful resources in the New York, New Jersey area to have genetic counseling and testing done. Do complete a cancer risk assessment. Um, there's actually a hereditary cancer quiz that you can take. Um, I can give you the website link to do that and it'll, it'll give you some red flags. If you do meet those red flags, you definitely need to speak to someone about genetic testing and you of course want to employ some healthy lifestyle choices as we just spoke about. Um, thank you so much. I just put up the website for our own a nonprofit foundation and the hereditary cancer quiz is actually here on our website. So if you're interested in taking that quiz to see if you have any high risk features in your family that warrant genetic testing, please do do that. And thank you so much for your attention. I would be very happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Lewin. So we're going to give everybody uh, a few minutes to send in some questions. We did just start to collect a few. I just have a couple of announcements. Um, thank you so much again uh, for taking the time, everybody who is on the call, and also, of course, to Dr. Lewin. Um, when we're wrapping up, we are, we're, we're not done yet. We have a couple more minutes left, but we will ask you to also just fill in a very quick um, brief uh, webinar survey to just make all of our webinars better moving forward. We also wanted to just quickly give you guys um, an update on some uh, more webinars that are coming up. Uh, Dr. Dennis Chi will be doing one in a couple of weeks on uh, reoccurrent ovarian cancer and we also um, have many other free programs in our Brooklyn Community Center. So please visit our website as well for more information. Um, so we did get a couple of questions and Dr. Lewin, you can still hear us, right, to answer a few? Yes, I can. Okay, good. Just testing. Um, so one of the uh, many questions that we get uh, fairly often, and we did get a couple tonight, is about what insurance covers. Um, you did seem to address that a little bit, but maybe you can get into that uh, uh, a little bit more, maybe how someone would go about finding out if they're eligible or maybe like those first steps. Um, but there's a lot of questions about, you know, that eligibility and how do I find out. That is a great question. So if you meet any of the criteria that I talked about tonight, because there are, you know, national criteria that have been established, the genetic test will be paid for. Um, you know, genetic testing is very progressive now. It's not like it used to be a few years ago. So say you have ovarian cancer or a family history of ovarian cancer, or breast cancer at a young age, any of those things that we mentioned, those NCCN guidelines, your test will be paid for. You know, if for some reason it's not paid for, which really over, over um, you know, 95% of patients, you know, don't pay anything for the test, 5% um, may pay less than $100, but the companies definitely have compassionate use, and so they want people who meet criteria to be tested. So. You know, I've never had insurance be a barrier to any testing. If for some crazy reason it is, there are definitely, you know, avenues to get the testing done for people. OK. 
Okay, thank you. I just want to make a reminder if anybody would like to ask a question, you just go up to the chat button, which is a little bubble on the top right hand corner. So feel free to send some more. In the meantime, uh, another question we have, if only one close relative has ovarian cancer, would you still be at risk? So it's always best to try and test the patient who has cancer herself. So if that close relative has not had genetic testing, I would really encourage her to do it because it's always more beneficial to test the patient who's effective, affected. Excuse me. If she, has she had genetic testing? If she has and she's had a panel testing from a reputable company and it's all negative, that substantially reduces the family member's risk of getting, getting ovarian cancer. Um, you know, as I said, if you have a first or second degree relative on mom or dad's side of the family with ovarian cancer, that definitely warrants genetic testing. If you can test the woman herself who has ovarian cancer, that's always best because if her testing is negative, it substantially, substantially drops the risk for anyone else in the family. If it's a first degree relative with ovarian cancer and all the genetic testing is negative, there still could be about a 5% risk of developing ovarian cancer. Um, and so that's something that really requires a really individualized discussion with your doctor about whether or not to remove your ovaries for that 5% risk reduction. Okay, thank you. Another question we got is, um, if you test positive, is that considered a pre-existing condition? And somebody goes on to say, um, the doctor wants um, them to get genetic testing, where should they call and make an appointment? Or, uh, the mother had breast cancer. I'll start off by saying that we do have a link that we're going to send out after this call where there's some resources where, um, you know, kind of like the genetic testing 101 little questions you might have answered, where do I turn first and who do I talk to? Um, so we'll make sure that everybody on tonight gets that link and then Dr. Lewin, if you'd like to add anything. That sounds great. So um, it's not considered a pre-existing condition, not. Uh, there are congressional laws in place that protect patients from any just genetic discrimination. So if any man or woman does have, you know, a genetic mutation in any gene, you cannot lose your health insurance. That is, um, there are congressional laws in place that have been, it's called the GINA Act. It's been in place at least since 2006, if not longer. So you absolutely cannot lose your health insurance. There are some states that may have a little loophole when it comes to life insurance. Um, so for a young, young person, like someone in their 20s who is getting tested, I would recommend thinking about life insurance. But like in New Jersey, for example, you cannot lose your life insurance or be discriminated life insurance. You know, um, each state is a little bit different. But most of the time, if someone is denied life insurance, it's because of her own personal history or family history, not because of a genetic testing result. You know, genetic counselors are, are a wonderful resource. There are very few of them, and sometimes there can be a long wait to get in to see them. There are many OBGYNs or internal medicine doctors that are doing genetic testing. Um, I'd love to see the resources you have. I do genetic testing in my office. You know, we use um, Myriad, which is the industry leader when it comes to genetic testing. You know, for some reason you're not able to find someone close to you. There are a lot of wonderful places in Brooklyn that can do this as well too. Um, you can always feel free to reach out to me um, or someone at Teal and we can help guide you to the appropriate places. Thank you. Um, we're, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, one of the questions we just got also is at what age should somebody consider genetic testing? You know, if someone has a child and they have ovarian cancer. That's a great question. I actually recommend doing the testing when you're going to do something about it. So technically, um, you could test someone starting at the age of 18 because he or she is definitely a legal consenting adult at that time. We don't usually do anything though until someone is about the age of about 25 or so. So I guess it would sort of depend on at what age the mother or, the, or someone in the family developed these cancers. Um, you know, certainly for a woman, we would not remove her tubes and ovaries until she's done having children, but the breast screening for breast cancer does start at the age of 25 or at least 10 years younger than the first age of onset in the family. So I do recommend at least, you know, somewhere in the window between 18 and 25. At least the mammograms alternated with MRIs can start. Um, and if we know someone has a BRCA mutation, we may want to put her on birth control pills, for example, to reduce her risk of ovarian cancer. 
Certainly knowledge is power. There's actually no downside to doing the test. There really is not. Um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, the power of a negative test is so important. And if the test is positive, then surveillance can happen until someone is, you know, ready to undergo prophylactic surgery and we really can prevent these hereditary cancers from happening. Great. Well, thank you very much. At the moment, there's no more questions. Oh, wait, we might have just got one more. Um, I I sorry, go ahead. <laughs> oh, this may be the question. I just wanted to reiterate again, if someone has tested negative for BRC1 and 2, I would really advocate getting the panel testing done. Um, the update test um, should be paid for by most insurance companies now. Um, you know, I have not seen a barrier to getting that testing done. Um, but it's very important, you know, to be sure we're not missing one of those other high-risk genes that have been identified. So it really, really is considered standard of care. I think that's what that question might have been about. Yes, it was. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to just stick around for another moment and just um, remind everybody about some other upcoming events and um, another webinar. If uh, We'll just take one more minute to see if anybody has any last questions. Sorry, I just... Lost my place, bear with me. Here we go. Um, so yeah, we're going to send around a survey in just a moment. Um, we're sending that out right now. And it's going to basically uh, just be a couple of quick questions for you to make sure um, that you know we did a good job tonight. And if anybody has any other suggestions for future webinars. And not to forget that we also have another webinar coming up with Dr. Chi. Yeah, and um, we also, um, whoop, I'm not sure if you guys can still hear me, but we, I'm sorry, but we have um, many different support systems and uh, resources available, so I know a lot of you uh, might even still have questions or think of one later on tonight. Feel free to email us and we'd be happy to, you know, find a, a resource for you and be able to better answer your questions even as you might go home and even discuss this with your family members, which we encourage. I think it's really important for everyone to know their family history and uh, make sure that, you know, you, you can collect as much information as you can uh, about this. Um, the last thing um, just to say is that we really appreciate everybody's time tonight. We thank Dr. Lewin tremendously for making time for us and her schedule this evening, and we hope it was informative. And since there's no further questions, I think we can end here. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a lovely evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.